Well, hello, everybody from around the world. I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy. As always, it's an honor to be with you. <coughs> taking you back with me to seminary. Today, we are doing a course in Christology, which is the study of Christ, which is a real seminary course, very difficult. But I've gone back through with the help of one of our theologians, Chris Sparks, and we have laid out for you, as easy as we can, the study of the precious blood and why it's one of the big four most important devotions we have. And so we're excited. This is our 58th course. <laughs> so you have plenty to choose from, but this is very important. So let us begin with a prayer. And before we do, I was just telling the people here, because you're all free to come and join us live if you're in the Northeast and uh, you're, you're passing through, that I have two big announcements that I'm going to make at the end today. Very important. I'm super excited about. So I told everybody, if you fall asleep, just then wake up for the last five minutes, and that way you can catch those announcements at the end. Let us begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask that your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, pour down his precious blood upon us to guide us, bless us, and protect us, especially in these times from the evil one. Through the protection of this precious blood, we have total trust in eternal life. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you again, everybody. As I mentioned, there are many devotions in the Catholic Church. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of devotions. And we hear all the time. I used to say this when I was coming back to my faith. My gosh, I want to do them all. And I bet some of you are the same way. You got your books and you've got your printouts and your novenas and your litanies and all these beautiful things. But it becomes overwhelming. It becomes so much that we can't do it. Then what happens? We get discouraged and then we just quit it altogether. That's not what we want to do. So one of the things I want to do is narrow down for you the four big ones. These four big ones, if you do nothing else, you've got the core of our Catholic faith. And we are pr a, a, a practicing those here at the Marian Fathers, and I believe that's why God sent each and every one of you here. First, it all starts with the Sacred Heart. The Sacred Heart, the link between God and His humanity, the divinity and the humanity of God through Jesus Christ. So the first one is the Sacred Heart of Jesus. We celebrate that the first Fridays. Join us the first Fridays. We have that live presentation where we walk you through it. Next is the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the first Saturdays, where we make reparation for the sin and ingratitude against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So we have first Fridays, the Sacred Heart. First Saturdays, the Immaculate Heart. Then, of course, those combine and culminate in divine mercy. Divine mercy is both the message of the gospel and a very important devotion. And Divine Mercy Devotion, you've heard me say it, is known by the acronym FINCH, the Feast, the Image, the Novena, the Chaplet, and the Hour of Mercy. That is the devotion of Divine Mercy, the big three, and now you can put it all under the umbrella of the precious blood. The precious blood being poured down upon all of us and our faith is protection. It's what saved us. It's what protects us. Nothing happens, and it's all tied together. Divine mercy, the rays of red and white, come from the sacred heart of Jesus. When Jesus was speared on the cross, what poured out the blood and the water that came from his heart? But what came out? Blood. So it's all tied together, the precious blood to the sacred heart, to divine mercy, all under the guidance of Mary. These are the big ones. And today, I've already talked about all those others in detail. Talked about the Sacred Heart in detail, the Immaculate Heart in detail, Divine Mercy in detail. I've not yet talked about the Precious Blood. This is why we're here today. So thank you for joining us. This is our 58th episode of Taking You Back to Seminary. I had to apologize to our Lord that I took 58 episodes to get to this most incredible, powerful devotion. All right, now, 
what happens. We have this, is it very critical? The month of July is dedicated to the sacred heart, excuse me, to the precious blood. And as I gave you the idea of why this is so important to begin, it's celebrated in July. Now, we worship the precious blood. It's not just a symbol or an element. We actually worship it because it is Jesus himself, not just an element of Christ, not just even an attribute. Jesus, well, Father, isn't divine mercy just an attribute? Yeah, it's his greatest attribute. But divine mercy is also who Jesus is as a person. That's why our website is the divine mercy. It's not just an attribute. It's Jesus as a person, the same with his precious blood. That's why these big four, the sacred heart and the first Fridays, the immaculate heart and the first Saturdays, divine mercy and the precious blood, all connected. So, to the Jews, blood was viewed as the main symbol of life. So what I'm going to do today, is I gave a homily a couple of weeks ago, I'm going to spend just the first 10 minutes summarizing that homily in case you didn't see it. If you did see it, this is a good recap, because then we're going to take you into why the precious blood is everything. It protects us, it saves us, it purifies us, it sanctifies us. It's all through the precious blood. This is what we have in our faith. This is why we're Catholic. Now, the, this is the thing. For the Jews, blood was the main symbol of life. When blood is spilled, the being dies. That is the essence of what we know. The penalty for sin, we also know, is death. So the two are connected. So if you have sin, and the penalty for sin is death, and death is symbolized by the spilling of blood, what does sin result in? The spilling of blood. So when there is sin, we have death. Why did Jesus die on the cross? You've heard me say this many times, because the penalty for sin is death. Sin is such a serious crime, we deserve the death penalty. So when we sin, it's just not, well, you know, whatever. Sin has been glorified in our culture today. This is where we're on the wrong road. But what we have to understand is the true meaning of sin is that it's so serious, it's a crime, the worst crime, because it's a crime against God, and through our neighbor is also a crime against God, and it deserves the death penalty. When you sin or I sin, we deserve to die. And so somebody did have to die because of our sins. Jesus Christ took our place. That's why he died on the cross. Now, when the penalty for sin is death, blood had to be shed to atone for that sin. So Christ did that. He shed the blood, and one drop of that blood is enough to redeem the whole world. One drop. One drop. Leviticus emphasizes the sacredness of blood through priestly sacrifice. It's the whole meaning of the mass. And as I said in my homily a couple weeks ago, God bless our Protestant brothers and sisters, but this is probably of all the things our Protestants missed. Mother Mary, the saints, of all the things our Protestant brothers missed. And they've missed many, God bless them. They they do have a lot of the truth. But of all the things they have missed, the single biggest is the meaning of sacrifice. Non-Catholic view is, Jesus did it all. All I have to do is throw my feet up on the desk and I'm good to go. Just profess it with my words. No, Jesus said, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. We have to be part of that sacrifice. And so we pray for our brethren. We love them. We pray to bring them back to Christ and the true meaning of the sacrifice. This is what's been lost. Now, how do we know this? Let's take a look. Let's look at Leviticus 17, 11. Let me read it. This is right from the Bible. Since the life of a living body is in its blood, I have made you put it on the altar so that atonement may thereby be made for your own lives, for blood makes atonement on the altar. This is Leviticus 17.11. It's telling us right here, this is where our faith comes from. 
And that has been lost everywhere except the Catholic Church. Everywhere. Only the Catholic Church still has the sacrifice on that altar. Now, it's not a bloody sacrifice anymore, but yet we are at Calvary in reality for the real sacrifice. Now, this is important, and, and we have, can't forget, in Exodus, Moses sprinkled blood on the people to ratify the covenant. Blood, atonement, for what? Sin. So the blood of Christ is now that way to do it. We don't need animal blood, the blood of the bullocks. Jesus did it all. Yes, he did. He fulfilled it. But his blood is what's precious. And we call it the precious blood because it's Christ's own great ransom paid for your redemption. This is what it is. Let's look at our next slide. This is a beautiful picture. This is the sacrifice of Christ shedding his blood on the cross, which is renewed. And I, okay, maybe I shouldn't say renewed which we are present for at every Mass. Every Catholic Mass you go into, there is a crucifix. We have it here at the shrine. We have it here at the altar. There is a crucifix. Because you are not reenacting the crucifixion. Because God is outside of time, Pope Benedict says in Spirit of the Liturgy that the roof of the church opens up and heaven and earth are connected and you are there at Calvary as Christ is paying what? Your debt for sin. What was the debt for sin? I said it a second ago, death. So Jesus is there paying your ransom by dying for you, but you're too busy watching football. Now, I've been there, <laughs> so I'm not criticizing anybody. I have missed Mass to watch football. Praise be to God, that hasn't happened in 22 years. But throughout my college life and in my college career, that was more important. Now we are here to see you are at Calvary as this sacrifice is taking place. It's not a reenactment. It's real. And so this is what's going on. Jesus gave his life. His blood was spilled for the sake of all of us, atoning for every form of human sin. This is important. Jesus was sent to the cross, as I said, to take our place. Now we have to accept that. It's just not automatic. And accepting that means you live it. So we look to the blood of Jesus as our redemption, for the wage of sin has now been paid. What's the wage of sin? Death. Who paid it? Jesus. How? He shed his blood. That's the atoning sacrifice. Father, how do you know that? It's, we just read it in the book of Leviticus. You put the atonement and the blood on the altar. That altar is both a table and a cross. That altar is where Christ is crucified on the cross, and that table is the altar where we shear in the meal of the Last Supper. Again, only in our Catholic faith. That's why we're Catholic. So we look upon this. That steep price that Christ paid should help us to realize how evil sin is. Sin has become casual now. It's become the way of the times. You know, Pius XII said mankind is more sinful today than he was even at the time of the flood. I look back, my gosh, that was in the 1950s. Leave it to Beaver. What would he say about us today? Since then, we've had legalized abortion, pornography on demand, contraception on demand. I mean, it's crazy. And so this should wake us up to realize how evil sin is when you contemplate the precious blood because he had to pour that blood out to save us from that sin. This is ultimately what blood does. The blood was shed so that our death now becomes life. And ultimately, that's what blood is for, life, not death. Blood can be either. Blood is your life when it's running through your veins, but blood is your death when it is spilled because you, you lose your life. And Jesus did it so that we, he died so that we could live. Now, the precious blood is a call to repentance and reparation. 
All of this ties together. This is what Mary's been asking for at Fatima. The first step in the way to heaven. And since it came from Christ, as I said, one drop could save the whole world. Jesus taught us in John 6 that we, it's so important, this precious blood that I'm talking about is so important, you got to drink it. He says, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. This is how important it is. You literally take it as part of you. Well, Father, our church doesn't d distribute the, the precious, but that's okay. I mean, we pray that it'll all come back. But remember, the host has the fullness of body, blood, soul, and divinity. So if you only get the host, you're still getting the body and the blood. Same in the precious blood. If somebody can't take a host and they're dying, you can put a drop of precious blood. They're getting the body, blood, soul, and divinity in all forms both forms of the Eucharist. Now, this is very important because this is what Jesus taught us in John 6. Now, blood separated from the body, a lot of people just say, oh, it's dried blood over there. That's just some material substance. Nah, it's not important. Yes, it is. Even dried blood has an infinite amount of information about the person who shed it. Same with Jesus Christ. The purpose of the incarnation is to heal and save human nature, all right? And in some part of that nature, we have salvation, or I should say all of it. But if any part of that human nature was missing in Jesus, he couldn't redeem us. So he needed everything we have as humans. What is that? In the incarnation, soul, body, and blood. That's why the Eucharist is body, blood, soul, and divinity. The first three are human. The body is his humanity. The blood is his humanity. The soul is his humanity. And it's matched with his divinity. So in the Eucharist, it comes together. Body, blood, soul, humanity, divinity, his as God. So far, import, so much important. So anyway, this is why it's important. Let's look at our next slide. This is what I'm talking about. This is the incarnation. Here we have the body, blood, soul, and divinity. You're looking at Jesus, the mystery of the incarnation. Now, as I said, this is the hypostatic union. Jesus came to heal us. What makes us human? Body, blood, and soul. Now, in our soul, as humans, we have spirits. It's what makes us different than the animals. You know plants and animals have souls. I don't know if you know that. Plants and animals have souls. It makes them alive. Anything alive has a soul. It's just not rational and it's not immortal. We humans, also like an animal and plant, we're alive. So we have souls. But we're different than the plants and animals because ours is a spirit. That's what makes you human. And so Jesus came to heal this disorder, our thinking, our wills, our emotions. This is why you want to go to healing prayer. So he took the human soul as well as the human body and blood so that he could redeem all of it. He's physical and spiritual, just like we are. So having two forms in the Eucharist is why we have body in one form, blood in another, but they're shared, that you, you get them both. We show a separation. The bishop not allowing a precious blood, and we're praying that it does, is okay in the sense that you still receive it all in the host. All right, now, let's go. I want to repeat one thing I said in that homily a couple weeks ago, because I think it's so powerful. Let's look at our next slide. St. John Chrysostom, one of my favorite saints, he's a saint of the East, he made the great point, and he said, and this is a picture on your screen of what? That's Passover. And I said this in a homily a couple weeks ago, but it's so worth mentioning. In Passover, what happened? The Jews put blood of the animals on their doorposts, the, the, the sacrifice lamb, the paschal lamb. And that paschal lamb had to be eaten or the sacrifice was invalid, just like we eat the Eucharist. And if they put the blood over the doorpost, the angel, as you see on your screen, would pass over the house because it saw the blood. 
Now it, it fled in fear because that blood, he as the angel of death, could not claim the people in the house. So the angel, the angel of death had to pass over the house. Now St. John Chrysostom said, if the angel of death is going to flee in fear over the blood of an animal, an, a lamb that's on the doorpost of the Jews, how much more will the angel of death who's coming for your soul at the moment of your death, if you have the blood on the window, or I should say the doorpost of your soul, your lips, how much more will that angel of death flee in fear if your lips contain the precious blood of the real lamb, Jesus Christ? This is amazing. And so this is what people don't know. It's not symbolic. Your, your doorpost to your temple, your, 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 your soul, this is the doorpost to your very being. And so you put the precious blood around there, it's protected just like the houses of Passover. Now seven times Jesus spilled his blood. He spilled his blood throughout his life. People think he only spilled it at the crucifixion, no. He was circumcised at eight days old, he spilled his blood. He spilled his blood in the agony of the garden at Gethsemane. He spilled his blood at the scourging of the pillar. He spilled his blood at the crowning of the thorns. He spilled his blood on the way of the cross, especially St. Bernard of Clairvaux tells us when his shoulder wound, he, he said to Bernard of Clairvaux that that was the worst wound of the entire passion was on his shoulder. The crucifixion itself, and then when he was pierced in the side by the lance, seven times he shed blood for us. So this is the greatest of devotions that is linked to the others I told you. The Sacred Heart on First Fridays, the Immaculate Heart on First Saturdays, the devotion of divine mercy, and the precious blood. They're all linked because the precious blood comes from the heart, the Sacred Heart. The divine mercy rays come from the heart, the Sacred Heart. And what comes out of the heart? Blood, the precious blood. And all of that is under the guidance of Mary, the Immaculate Heart. Yet God it all, right here. So, his humanity and blood are worthy of our adoration because they unite Jesus with us, the blood. We venerate the Sacred Heart, the divine mercy and the wounds of our Lord for the same reasons. The Sacred Heart is his humanity. And we precious blood, we, we adore the precious blood. Now, our sinful nature has been separated from God's presence through our sins. And only Jesus' blood can mend that. We are washed away in our sins and reconciled back to the Father. What does precious blood do? This is where I want to finish from my homily of the past. It ransoms us, ransoms us from death, as I said, Revelation 5.9. It frees us from sin, replaces the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. We know that from Hebrews 9, Hebrews 13, 1 John 1, Revelation 1. It redeems us and justifies us. We know that from Acts 20, Romans 3, Romans 5, Ephesians 1, Peter, 1 Peter 1. It reconciles us to God, Ephesians 2, Colossians 1. It equips us for the mission God is giving us, Hebrews 13, and empowers us to conquer sin, Revelation 12. I can go on and on. We'll study Bible later. Now, I gave a talk about Eucharistic miracles a couple times. What is the basis of the Eucharistic miracles? When you look at our faith in the Eucharist, and we talk about Eucharistic miracles, what does it always involve? The blood. The hosts bleed. The blood has been tested. The blood has hemoglobin and DNA from a human origin. The substance originates from inside a living being. It's not external. It's not like I cut my hand and then drop the blood on the host. The blood has the properties of being internal, not external. If I cut my hand and put it on a host and said, look, a miracle, they would be able to tell. The properties of the blood are internal, not external. All right? 
The blood is always AB, which is the universal receiver. Similar to that that's found on Lunciano, the host. And I'm sorry, I, I want to show you on the screen. These are the proof of the Eucharistic miracle. See the blood on those hosts in different forms? This is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. The Holy Shroud has blood on it. That blood tests the same exact properties. AB, the universal receiver, Christ takes all into his heart. Studies reveal that the tissue is that of human heart tissue, the myocardium. And the fact that the outer part of the blood in all these Eucharistic miracles has co coagulated, right, for years while the inner part of the blood is fresh and indicates the tissue continues to effuse fresh blood. This is unexplainable because it's not attached to a living being. Where's the fresh blood coming from? From Jesus. Furthermore, the blood contains proteins indicating elevated metabolism in the person from which the tissue came, which was found to be in trauma. The properties of the blood basically show that where all this blood comes from, the person was in trauma. They know that from the properties. The blood, I said this before, has white blood cells. White blood cells die in a matter of minutes outside of the human body or outside of the living body. The very fact that this blood is years and years old and there's still white blood cells means it's alive. It's alive. And it was removed from the body when the body was alive or it wouldn't have white blood cells. It didn't come from a cadaver. So this blood also only has the X chromosome. Remember how a baby gets its chromosomes? Remember? The mother always supplies the X. The father supplies an X or a Y. If the father also supplies an X, you have two Xs, it's a girl. If the father supplies a Y, you have an X from the mom, a Y from the dad, and you have a boy. There is not 27 other letters or 26 other letters in the alphabet to make 26 other genders. Hogwash, there's two. This blood has only the X chromosome, which means it has no earthly father. Impossible, but not for God. All right. I mentioned I worked a little bit with one of my theologians, and um, I want to show sort of the things that he, he pointed out that I wanted to add to this talk because I thought they were really good. Do you know the Divine Mercy devotion, which we center on here, and we should, Divine Mercy is both a message and a devotion. The message of Divine Mercy is the heart of the gospel, but the devotion of Divine Mercy, the feast, the image, the novena, the chaplet, and the hour of mercy, they're all based on the precious blood. Even the devotional father, why are you talking about the precious blood so important? I thought you were divine mercy. Divine mercy is based on the precious blood. How do we know this? Look at the chaplet. The chaplet is offering the body, blood, soul, and divinity in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. What about the image? What comes out of the image? The rays of red and white. What's the ray? The precious blood. What about the feast? How do you get the, the, the graces of Divine Mercy Sunday? You go to confession and Holy Communion. What do you receive at Holy Communion? The body, the blood, the soul, and the divinity. Whether it's just from the host or from the precious blood or both. The hour of mercy. Three o'clock, we celebrate the hour of mercy. Why? That was the time where Jesus' spear, the spear went through Jesus' chest cavity, punctured the heart, and what came out? Blood and water. This is the entire thing of the divine mercy. What's the prayer we start with every day? Oh, blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus, a font of mercy for us, I trust in you. Let's look at our next slide. This is from St. Faustina's diary. This is the prayer for the conversion of sinners. Father Seraphim used to point out all the time. He used to always give me the, the wagging finger. You, Father Chris, you must always remember, you keep forgetting to tell people. At the three o'clock hour, the main thing Jesus wanted us to do was to pray for the conversion of sinners. And I would say, well, Father, what particular way? 
Oh, blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus is a font of mercy for us. I trust you. That's the conversion of sinners. That's the conversion prayer. It's on your screen. A prayer for conversion of sinners was focused on the blood and the water. Blood is life. And so his life also has his love, his beauty, his goodness, his being, his truth. When you receive the Eucharist and the precious blood, you receive all that. You receive God's goodness, his beauty. Christ received his humanity. Now, this is fascinating. And this is what I wanted to share from you from our theologian. Christ received his humanity from Mary. Our Lady then, and Jesus got his blood from Mary. So the font of the precious blood which saves us is from Mary and her humanity. Now, that doesn't mean she's the source of all grace of redemption. No, it's through her. Not from her. Through her. So Our Lady, in a sense, is the fount of the precious blood. Her DNA is in Jesus. So we have a connection with Mary in Holy Communion. Don't forget our Blessed Mother. That's why she's part of the big four devotions, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. All right, let's keep going. In the oldest document that we have in the church outside of sacred scripture, to me, I'm history. You all know that. I love my history. Do you know outside of sacred scripture, the oldest document we have in the church is from the first century, 96 AD, by Pope St. Clement I, who was the fourth pope. Peter um, came first, Linus, Cletus, Clement. So he's the fourth pope. He said, quote, let us fix our gaze. The whole thing he said, fix our gaze on the blood of Christ. Somebody said, well, Father, I thought it's the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is the blood of Christ. The cross is the way to salvation because it's his blood. What, drew, what did the cross do? It's not a piece of wood that saves you. It's the blood that was drawn out from the cross. So we realize how truly precious it is, seeing that it was poured out for our salvation and brought grace of conversion to the world. That's why we pray, Father Seraphim, focused on the three o'clock hour being about conversion through the precious blood. I'm sorry I'm getting so excited. I'm probably giving you all a headache. I, I just, this is everything. I'll try not to, to, to yell too loud. I just, this is everything. This is why we're alive. And this is how we will have eternal life. Amazing. To understand the meaning of the precious blood, we must have some understanding, as I said before, about the gravity of sin. The awfulness of offending God is lost today. It is required, it is so serious that the blood of the Son of God, that's how serious sin is, that it took the blood of the Son of God to forgive it. We're living in an age where sin has become fashionable. That's sad. So devotion to the precious blood is not a spiritual option. It's a spiritual obligation. Don't forget that. Lack of it, the saints tell us, cause all our social ills. You know, devotion to the precious blood is important because it means loving Jesus and the blood that he shed for us. It further means devotion to the precious blood that we invoke Christ under his precious blood, both species, body and blood. That's why the church separating those two before 1969 was a good thing, in my opinion. But now in the Missal, they've combined the precious blood and the body of Christ in, in Corpus Christi. In the old calendar, it was separated. Now, to be devoted to someone, what does that mean? We see some beautiful husband and wife combinations here, unions. What does it mean to be devoted to someone? Many things, love, giving, 
But staying the course is a big one. Staying the course, even during difficult times. So loving and suffering, love and suffering are inseparable. I did this in a past talk. Father John Harden said, pain is the proof of love. <laughs> Some of our spouses are probably going, ain't that for sure. Pain is the proof of love and pain is the price of love. That's why God became a man so that he might be able to endure the pain, especially the pain of draining his blood out of love for us. Love and suffering are inseparable. If you're willing to die some above for someone, that's the ultimate love. I'm willing to suffer to the point of death for you, to give my life for you. No greater love hath a man than to lay down his life for another. Devotion also means imitation. You have a devotion to a saint, you want to imitate that saint. Meaning, the martyrs. You know, growing up, I always wondered, what, what's the huge deal about being a martyr, other than being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Right? And then I realized there's a lot more to that. If Christ showed his love for us by the shedding of his blood, we too are to show our love for him by the shedding of our blood. Now, we don't necessarily mean physically. Sometimes, yes, 100,000 Christians a year lose their life because of their faith. So it does mean physically. But it can also mean spiritually when you have to die to yourself every day, when you really don't feel like dealing with the children tonight, but you still cook them dinner. When you really don't feel like helping them with their homework, but you still do to help them. You really don't feel like dealing with your spouse tonight, but you do because you love them. Powerful stuff. So millions who believe in the precious blood prove their life or their love for him by their sufferings. Well, Father, I got a lot of sufferings. That's how you can show your love for God. Offering them up. We can pray for the gift of martyrdom, true, but like Jesus, he said, let the cup pass me by. But here's the thing. Let no opportunity of suffering go by. Don't waste it. Your blood is being shed spiritually. Every pain, joy, sorrow, pleasure, pain, in a way, is shedding blood. That's why the church teaches about the Mass that you unite to the cross of Christ on that altar. This is what the church means when she says that Christ offers himself daily on this altar in the sacrifice of the mass, so should we. We should put ourselves on that altar. When that patent is lifted by that priest, you should put yourself on that patent being offered back to the Father. Let's look at our next slide. You know who this is? That's Cain killing Abel. That's a picture of Cain killing Abel. Why? All right, Cain and Abel both made an offering to God. Abel's sacrifice was pleasing to God. Cain's was not. So what did Cain do? Killed him. It was the beginning of the rise of sin, the sin of hatred and revenge. And in fact, they can be so serious that we even murder our loved ones, the worst of all. So the Bible tells us in very dramatic way, that the thirsting earth soaked up Abel's blood as it shouted to heaven for vengeance. Avenge this death. Now, that scene prefigured the scene at Calvary, where Christ's blood cried out to heaven as well, but this time, not in vengeance, but for the redemption of mankind. Fascinating. Now it continues through the church in the sacrifice of the mass. The blood that Christ shed is crying to heaven for redemption. 
The church reminds us that the first drops of blood that flowed for our redemption began the day Christ was born. Well, eight days later, the circumcision. And he's been continuously shedding it ever since. I just gave you seven other times. So let's look now at our next slide. From Adam's side came Eve, right? But from Jesus' side came what on the cross? The blood in the water. Look at your slide. There's a picture of the spear going in the side of Jesus and going all the way through his chest when the, when the um, centurion speared him. What came out of his side was actually the spear created a hole, punctured the heart. And look at this heart there. If you look real closely, there is the pericardium fluid surrounding the heart. That spear, as you look at it, punctured that, and from it flowed out the blood and the water, as was found on the shroud of Turin. So anyway, from Jesus' open side, the blood and the water flowed out. These are symbols of what? Blood and water are symbols of what? Baptism and communion. Uniquely Catholic. Christ's side poured out the blood and water. This was the symbol of the church, the mother of all the living, the new Eve. So Jesus is the new Adam, and from his side poured out the new Eve. Who's the new Eve? Mary. Who's she? The mother of the church. It all connects. You know, when I was trying to disprove the Catholic faith, I, I wasn't like Scott Hahn. I wasn't smart like him. But every time I went and tried to disprove it, I ended up finding another piece of a puzzle that seemed to fit into this bigger picture. You can't find a piece of the Catholic puzzle that does not fit perfectly because it's the truth. So through this blood and water that came out of the side of Jesus, he willed to redeem us and lead us to eternal life. Now, it gets better. On the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, as the one day of the year the Jewish high priest could enter into the temple and go right to the center of the Holy of Holies and sprinkle blood, right? On the mercy seat, in atonement for everybody's sins and punishment. That has been fulfilled. The high priest would make this annual entrance, sprinkle the blood for the sins of the people. That has now been fulfilled. How? Look at your next slide. The image of divine mercy. For those of us in, per in person, the image right above the altar. What's going on there? The church sees a much deeper meaning now. Our divine high priest, who is Jesus, look at that image on your screen, is coming out of the Holy of Holies, as Ch Father Seraphim always taught, the darkness. He's the high priest, and on Good Friday, he entered the Holy of Holies, which is not made by human hands nor sprinkled with animal blood. But now he comes out after shedding his own blood, the true lamb, and sins and punishment are forgiven. Just like Yom Kippur in the Jewish tradition, our Divine Mercy Feast fulfills that. Incredible. Now upon the altar is the real lamb, slain but alive, covered in his own blood. There is a countless army of redeemed souls that are present at every Mass, the angels and the saints. They are all wearing what? White garments. Why white? Because the Bible tells us they were washed in the precious blood. It all comes together in the blood of the Lamb. You know, St. Catherine of Siena, a great saint, I was reading in her dialogue, she was instructed by God the Father. Remember, she was the saint that spoke directly to God the Father unlike many other saints in all of history. And the father said, never look at your sins or the sins of the others without gazing upon the precious blood of Jesus as the remedy. 
He's not saying not look at your sins. He's saying, oh, yeah, yeah, look at your sins. But don't look at them without gazing upon the precious blood. That's why when I go into adoration, I have an image of divine mercy with me. If your mind wanders or you're all over the place, take an image of divine mercy. And then when you start recalling your sins, don't get down, don't despair. I mean, yeah, use it as a, as a, as a uh, helpful tool to clean up. But God the Father told Catherine of Siena, never look at your sins or the sins of others without looking at the precious blood as a remedy. So somebody's driving you crazy, people within the church, those sins need to be addressed, but we need to have that precious blood poured upon them. Are we praying that the precious blood be poured upon them, on our politicians, our bishops? I'm the first one in line to try to correct them, but I'm also now realizing, going back to seminary with you, I, I, I'm so grateful for this, that we're doing this every Saturday, because these are things I forgot. And I'm going back and working with, with, with my theologians and Chris and my seminary notes. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. And so this is what it's telling. If we look only at our sin, we'll fall into discouragement, despair, and anxiety. We'll be scrupulous. Now that's important we look at sins. We're supposed to do examination of conscience every day. But the remedy, the penicillin, is the precious blood. If we look at the precious blood, then we see that the sin has no hope. It's been paid for. It's been ransomed. No sin is unforgivable except one, not asking for God's mercy. That no sinner is beyond the mercy of God if he repents, but it's not a free ticket. Well, Father, you're saying I can go do whatever I want. No. Clean up Dodge, but keep it clean with the precious blood. Jesus' love expressed in the blood and the water of the divine mercy image is infinitely greater than all the sins of humanity ever committed combined. One drop. But you got to rely on it. The St. Gertrude prayer. Let's talk about the different forms of the most powerful prayers in the church. I love this. The most powerful forms of prayer in the Catholic church all have almost the same exact wordings. The St. Gertrude prayer. St. Faustina's uh, blood and water prayer. The angel at Fatima. Let's look at these. Next slide. Uh, Brother Mark's going to put up the next slide. The St. Gertrude prayer is a powerful prayer asking for relief of the suffering in purgatory. It does what? It prays to the precious blood. What is the St. Gertrude prayer? Let's read it. Eternal Father, I offer thee the most precious blood of thy divine son Jesus, in union with the masses said throughout the world today, for all the holy souls in purgatory, for sinners everywhere, for sinners in the universal church, those in my own home and within my own family. Notice what she called out there. I offer thee the most precious blood of thy divine son. She didn't say I offer the divine toenail. I offer the divine or the uh, precious blood of thy divine son. St. Gertrude promised that a thousand souls would be released from purgatory. We gotta be a little careful there to understand that sometimes that's a number symbolically meaning a great multitude, a perfect number of souls. There are many times precious blood is mentioned in the Bible. Father, where is this in the Bible? I get that every day. First Peter 1, 17 through 19. Revelation 7, verse 14. Revelation 12, verse 10, 11. I could go on and on. The precious blood, that is in Scripture. Now, it is by the blood of Jesus that we are not only washed clean of our past, but we're made holy for the future. This is the beauty of it. It's like protecting. You ever get your, um, when I had my blazer, my truck, I got an undercoating because there was some rust. And they went in there and they cleaned up the old rust on the bottom of the truck, sanded it down, cleaned up the mess of the past. And then they put this undercoat on it as a protective measure for the future. And I had that doggone blazer for another seven, eight years, never a speck of rust. That's what the precious blood does for you. It cleans up all your grime of the past and then it protects, puts a protective layer on the future to sanctify you. 
every day that you get up, you should pray to pour Jesus, to pour the precious blood on you and your family and your loved ones. If you do nothing else, make that little prayer in the morning. Jesus, please pour your precious blood upon me and my family, my loved ones, to protect us, to cleanse us of our past, and to protect us in the future. This is powerful stuff. All right, now, this is what we do. All right, it's appropriate that we join our prayers together with the Mass and offer it to the Father in atonement for our sins for those in purgatory. Now, how can we make this offering? Did you hear that prayer? Eternal Father, this is the St. Gertrude prayer. I offer thee the most precious blood of thy divine Son. How can we make this offering? To offer to the Father the precious blood of the Son? You're not God. How do you do this? The prayer is an extension of the Mass. Well, Father, I thought only a priest could offer sacrifice. That's true. Wait a minute. I'm confused. You're telling me that only a priest can offer sacrifice. Yes, it's true. But then why are you telling me to make this prayer, Eternal Father, I offer you the most precious body and blood or body of, of, of your son? Because by virtue of your baptism, you are priest, prophet, and king. This is why we say you are a prophet. What does a prophet do? Teaches. You are called to teach your loved ones, your family, and the ways of the Lord. You are a king. What does a king do? A king governs. You're to govern your body and health and your family and holiness. You are a king. But by virtue of your baptism, you're also a priest. Now, not a ministerial priest, as we always say. Don't go, go around confecting the Eucharist or hearing confessions. But you are a common priesthood. And in the common priesthood, what does a priest do? Offers sacrifice. That's why the chaplet can also be made using those words, eternal father. I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity. You're making sacrifice. That's why I always teach, if you can't make it to mass, do two things. Pray the rosary. It's like liturgy of the word. It's not a bunch of Hail Marys. It's a meditation on scripture. What's the first part of the Mass? Meditation on Scripture. What's the Rosary? Scripture. The visitation, the transfiguration, the uh, scourging at the pillar, the carrying of the cross, the visitation of Mary. The Rosary is scriptural. It's like the first part of the Mass, meditation on Scripture, liturgy of the Word. What's the second part of the Mass? Liturgy of the Eucharist. What happens in the Liturgy of the Eucharist? The priest offers sacrifice. What can you do? Join him because you too are in the common priesthood of Christ, you can make sacrifice. That's why you can say, Eternal Father, I offer you. I'm making sacrifice. It might be the only time you ever do it is through this prayer of either St. Gertrude or St. Faustina. They're almost identical. And so St. Gertrude it pointed this important thing out to us. Now, St. Faustina gave us a prayer that was very similar. Let's have Brother Mark put this one on the screen. Listen to how similar this prayer is. Eternal Father, I offer you the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and the sins of the whole world. What prayer is that? The chaplet. It sounds very identical. I offer you, what's the common word in both? Blood. Blood is the word in both of those. So Faustina gave us this prayer, the chaplet. So when we pray the offering of the precious blood, we are doing so outside of Mass, but in a way that's like the Mass. It's taking the Mass home. <laughs> if you could take one thing home with you, it's not your Rolodex at work, it's not your nice shiny file cabinet at work. If you're going to take something home with you, take the Mass. And this is what you do through the rosary and the chaplet. It's doing the same thing outside of the Mass that we do in the Mass using our prayers and petitions, our sacrifice through the Eucharist. There is enough grace in a single consecrated host to redeem the entire world. Because why? Jesus is present. Jesus is present in it. So too, there is sufficient grace in any consecrated host to let all the souls out of purgatory. Well, Father, then why doesn't it happen? If you're telling me there's enough grace in one host to empty purgatory, how can we keep praying as purgatory isn't emptied? You know why? Because the catechism tells us the answer. 
The Catechism says that the Eucharist is the source and summit of our faith, right? Because Jesus is present, correct? Body, blood, soul, and divinity. It's a real grace, not a symbol. However, God's grace is constrained by your trust and faith. Jesus said, if you have faith, you can move mountains. But if you don't have faith, even he can't work a miracle. Don't you remember the Bible? Jesus went into the town and he couldn't do anything. As Father Mike Gailey says, he might have cured one ingrown toenail or something. But he couldn't do anything because the people had no faith. Do you realize in the single host that you personally get at communion, I'm not talking about anybody else, I'm talking to you, that single host that you have in your hand is enough to empty purgatory if you have enough trust and faith in your church, your sacraments, in the grace of God. Amazing. All right, we got to wrap up here. I know I'm running a little behind. So Jesus said to St. Faustina, the graces of my mercy, grace now, are drawn by the means of one thing. One thing. You want to get to heaven, you need grace. Jesus told St. Faustina, there's only one way you're going to get that grace. What is it? One vessel, and that vessel is trust. The more the soul trusts, the more it will receive. If you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you will be able to move mountains, Jesus said. Nothing will be impossible for you. So the church teaches that how powerful your prayers are depend on you, not God. God's already pouring it on you. But Father, why come God isn't answering my prayers? Do you have the faith? Do you have the belief? Do you have the trust? That's the question. So we have to have God's mercy. He pours it. His grace, he pours it. But you've got to cooperate with it. That's where, again, we're different from the Protestants. The Protestants get it that God's grace and mercy is what saves you. We do too. We believe that. But what they don't continue the, the, the conversation is that you've got to cooperate with that grace. Very important. Now, St. Faustina. Let's go to our next slide. This is just awesome. Listen to what Jesus says to St. Faustina, or what Faustina tells us. In Diary 72, this is what St. Faustina said. Jesus, do not permit, and you know what? We say this every day at the three o'clock hour here at the shrine. Every day at the shrine, you can tune in. We say this prayer. Diary number 72. Jesus, she says, do not permit the loss of souls redeemed at so dear a price of your most precious blood. Oh, Jesus, when I consider the great price of your blood, I rejoice in its immensity. For one drop alone would have been enough for the salvation of all sinners. This is everything we've been talking about. So we're not leading you astray. We're teaching you the words of Jesus. So St. Faustina gave us clarity on how important the precious blood is. But there were many others too. I, I just want to briefly mention these. In a letter to Pope Leo XII, St. Gaspar del Buffalo wrote, this is interesting, all the other devotions, all other devotions are good and are aids to Catholic piety. But this devotion, devotion to the precious blood, and I would add to that divine mercy because it's about the precious blood. First Friday, sacred heart because it's about the precious blood, the heart of Jesus, which he came from, and the immaculate heart of Mary in first Saturdays. He said, all devotions are good. They all aid in Christian piety. But this devotion, the precious blood is the foundation, support, and essence of faith. And our Protestant brothers don't have it? Wow. How blessed are you? They're doing twice as much with half the tools. They're building a house with a simple saw and hammer. You've been given entire electronic, most advanced power tools in the world and you're not using them. 
He considered the precious blood the source of Mary's privileges, her immaculate conception, her divine maternity, her assumption, her queenship. He said that this devotion can lead a soul. This is amazing. Remember the three levels of holiness I talked to you about before. You can find it online. The purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. The pur- all three will save you. The purgative is basically saying, I want to get to heaven just to avoid hell. I just don't want to spend hell in eternity. You can be saved by that. It's enough. It's not the preferred way. But it's, it's, it's I don't want to go to hell. That's why you turn to God. You don't want to go to hell. That's the purgative. The illuminative is, I want to go to heaven because there's something good in it for me. For me, it would be, I can fish all the time. Brother Mark and I can get up there catching bigger bass than we've ever caught, right? So it's still some selfishness, but it's still enough because there's something good in it for us, so we turn to God. But the illuminative, I'm sorry, that's the illuminative, but the unitive way is I want it purely to be united with God nothing else. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about what I do in heaven. I don't care when I do it in heaven. I don't care anything else. I just want to be united to God. That's the way of the saints. Now, Saint um, de Buffalo um, Gaspar said that this devotion can lead you from the purgative to the illuminative to the unitive. That's your goal in the spiritual life. Work your way. And he's saying the way to do that is through the precious blood. Powerful stuff. In 1960, John the 23rd, some of you remember him, he wrote an apostolic letter, Inde Aprimi, which encouraged devotion to the precious blood. He said Christ's blood was shed at his circumcision, at circumcision in the Garden of Gethsemane, in the tortures of the Passion and the Crucifixion, the crowning of thorns, the nailing to the cross, the spearing of his side. We talked about all that. And he said, If only we would be more mindful of the price of our salvation, of Christ having to shed his blood for us so that we could live and be redeemed from our sins, we would be more likely to avoid sin in the future. You want to get the most out of your holy hour? You want to know what to do in the holy hour? You want to know how to stay focused in the holy hour? Split it. Spend some of the time reflecting on your sins. Do an examination of conscience. Gee, I did that. I went here today. What did I do? Oh, I yelled at the clerk in the gas station because the gas pump wasn't working. I swore in traffic and I did this. Oh, boy. Go into the holy hour. Review your day, but don't get discouraged. If you leave it at that, that's what the God the Father said to St. Catherine of Siena. If you leave it at that, you're going to get discouraged. Then pull out the picture of the divine mercy knowing that God's going to wipe away those sins that you just did with that precious blood if you ask, A, B, C, A, ask for God's mercy. And if you really messed up in mortal sin, get to confession, and that's where the real precious blood will be poured upon you. That's why the rays of red and white are confession, the cleansing waters of confession, and baptism, and then the Eucharist. Now, in 1916, Sister Lucia was with... Francisco and uh, Jacinta, and the angel appeared to them, not on May 13, 1917, but actually back in 1916. And the angel appeared holding in his left hand a chalice, and over it, in the air, was a host. So you have this chalice, and over the chalice was this host. And Sister Lucia said, from that host, the precious blood dripped into the chalice. Now, the angel left the chalice in the air. So the angel has this chalice, and above the chalice is this host. And from the host is dripping the precious blood. And the angel leaves it in the air, steps back, and kneels down with the children, worshiping the precious blood and the host, the body and the blood. Then what did he do? The angel then sat down and told him to repeat this prayer three times. Let's look at our screen. This is the prayer in that critical moment. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I adore you profoundly 
and I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. What does that sound like? The chaplet of divine mercy. What does that sound like? The prayer of St. Gertrude? Of Jesus Christ present in all the tabernacles of the world in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences. That's why we do First Fridays and First Saturdays in reparation for all the... Um, Outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences. See how these four big devotions tie together? By which he is offended, and by the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and the immaculate heart of Mary, there's your first Fridays, first Saturdays, I beg the conversion of poor sinners. That's the three o'clock hour of divine mercy. And how are they clear, purified and converted in the three o'clock hour? By the precious blood. So you got your sacred heart in First Fridays, your divine or your um, immaculate heart in your first Saturdays. You have your precious blood and you have your divine mercy. The prayers that relate to each of those are almost identical. We don't see this. It, it's so clear if we open our heart and say, Lord, show me. Well, he brought you here today. So he's showing you. And he can use the most broken tools to do that. Amazing. So what happened after this? These are all similar prayers. So this is what Sister Lucia said happened next. He gave her the host and the contents of the chalice, the precious blood he gave to Jacinta and Francisco, the two saints. Lucia is not a saint yet, but this is amazing saying at the same time, eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, terribly outraged by the ingratitude of men. Offer reparation for their sake and console God. So what did Mary ask at Fatima? First Saturdays. Whew. That's why we have first Fridays and first Saturdays. It's all connected with divine mercy and the precious blood. Keep staying with us because we're going to keep feeding you these four. This is what we do if we live our Catholic faith. So the average human, now how important is this blood? I want to finish now. Let's talk about now the practical side of blood because I think this is interesting and I think it fits. The average human being is less than 10% blood. So you have about a gallon and a half of blood in your body right now. If you were to be drained of every drop of your blood, you'd have about a gallon and a half. You got a lot more water. The human body is what, nine, over, way over 90% water. Notice, blood and water. <laughs> in a single day, 100, a 150 pound person, I used to be 150 pounds, <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> But an average 150 pound person, your heart beats about 100,000 times in a day. Your heart beats on average about 100,000 times a day. Why? To pump the blood through the body. And guess how much it pumps? About 2,000 gallons. Now it's the same blood, but it's just being repumped. Your heart beats 100,000 times a day to pump 2,000 gallons of blood through your vascular system of vessel, vessels, arteries, and capillaries that if they took it out of you and put it in a line, would reach around the world twice. And there's no intelligent designer. That's not from some amoeba crawling out of the ocean by chance. And I'm going to do a whole talk on creation coming up. Stay with us. But all those things in your human body are from an intelligent designer. Now, red blood cells transport your oxygen and remove all the carbon dioxide and the waste from the body. Guess how many of those you got? 25 trillion. 25 trillion. That's bigger than our national debt. At least, hopefully, it will always be many or the route we're on. So you have this work of God's incredible 
incredible intelligent design. Each red blood cell lasts about four months, so you're constantly being created anew. You don't think, you know that expression, you, you can't change, you can never change? Hogwash, Mary Magdalene changed, St. Paul changed. You can change. Your physical body changes every four months. You're not the same person, at least cellular-wise. This is amazing. So let's look at our next slide. We're almost running, running, uh, almost finished here. This is why we, you know, sometimes we could take the, the, the blood for granted, not just our own blood. You take it for granted that it's working, doing its thing in your body, but you could also take for granted the precious blood. Let's look at our screen. The month of July is the month of the precious blood. This is what we are talking about. It's not well known. June was the sacred heart. Nine out of 10 people know that June's pride month for ridiculous reasons, but it's, pride shouldn't be celebrated. We're not here to celebrate pride as a sin. I do it my way, not God's way. Everybody knows June's pride month. How many people know that June was the month of the sacred heart? How many people know that July is the month of the precious blood? Why? Because the precious blood comes from the sacred heart. It came on the cross when Jesus' heart was speared, the blood and the water came out. Now, Pius IX decreed in August 1849 that the first Sunday of July would be dedicated to the most precious blood. Now, as I mentioned, in 1969, the feast was removed. Don't despair. It was taken off the calendar because they already had, they claimed, the solemnities of the Passion, Corpus Christi, the Sacred Heart. So they combined it with Corpus Christi, body and blood. But it's still celebrated on the old calendar and in the ordinary form, it can be celebrated as a votive mass. That's why some of you that were with me a couple Fridays ago, I celebrated the votive mass for the precious blood. It's a great thing for a church to do. So. The point here is this. Why do I bring all this up? There are parallels with blood in your human body, in your circulatory system, and the tradition of the church. Last half page. Praise be to God, right? If the church, this is amazing. If the church was born because Christ poured out his most precious blood for our redemption, and the sacraments came from that, Christ basically conquered natural death. Why? Because he spilled his blood, which is death. He died, but then he rose. Now, in pouring out his own blood to the world, he gave up his life to give us everlasting life. Now, stay with me. The church has become that vascular system of arteries and capillaries for all human life, bringing oxygen to all parts of the body. Who's the body? The church. Because it needs cleansing of sin, it's like the poison, like that carbon dioxide and that waste in your body. So the precious blood from the church purifies that. The hundreds of thousands of masses that are celebrated each day. There's 425,000 priests alive in the world, and every one of them is supposed to celebrate at least one mass a day. Some celebrate two or three. So at a minimum, we should have 400,000 masses. Let's say take out a percentage that are sick. But then you have others that are duplicating masses. So we should have at least 400,000 masses going on in the world every day. That means every minute of every day, somewhere around the world, there's a mass going on. We're speaking right now from the National Shrine. Somewhere, probably even in our chapel upstairs, there is a mass going on. And that mass is continually pouring that life-giving blood just like your body. If it didn't have the heart pumping the blood to it, you would die. The church is pumping the precious blood through the body, which is us, so we don't die. We, each day that these masses are celebrated, it's like heartbeats that keep the church alive. And then you, being pumped up, are sent out like apostles. There may be times of mistake and illness, sin, depravity, even within the church. We've got to clean that up. 
but it's of God. It will endure. It will not bleed out. We just got to make sure that we minimize the losses of souls in the process. The church will not be overcome, but souls will be. And the way to bring souls back to God is the precious blood, as seen in the divine mercy, the sacred heart, and the immaculate heart of Mary. On an individual level, when we are tempted to despair at everything going on in the church and the division and evil in society, think of your own heartbeat. Think of the poison in your body that every heartbeat of blood is going to pump through and remove that carbon dioxide and that waste. Each of those 100,000 beats a day, which is 35 million a year. Think back to when coronavirus started. What, a year and a half ago? So 15, 35, 30, 40, 50. Your heart has beat 50 million times since coronavirus. Billions over a lifetime. Did I say billion? I meant million. 50 million times. Your heart will beat billions of times over a lifetime. And that is evidence that there is a creator. Down to every last little microcell that the loving creator has given us to exist every second of the day. Where's God? Ask if you just took a heartbeat a second ago. There's God. If God can do that, then we can believe we can have confidence that he will guide the faithful who put ourselves in communion with the church and his precious blood where we will remain with him plugged in to the most precious blood of Christ now and forever. Hmm. We can keep the church alive through our prayers, through our efforts to get her back on the right course from all the mistakes she's making. Correct your priests, correct the bishops if needed. I've learned so much from your corrections. I, I, I'm humbled because it's, it's incredible. Now, sometimes, yes, I have to stand up for the truth because some of those are, are false teachings, like telling me that I worship Mary. <laughs> I don't worship Mary. But this is the pumping of the blood. We keep the church alive through these prayers, through these litanies. Now, the litanies, and I want to finish right now, we're done. Because the litanies that have been approved by the church for universal recitation are actually not that many. But one of them is the litany of the precious blood. And I want to play this video right now and have you all join us in prayer as we pray the litany of the precious blood. So let's have Brother Mark cue that video and we'll come back and sign off with the two special announcements that I want to give. Let us watch this beautiful video on the litany of the precious blood. The litany of the most gonna precious pray. blood. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven, have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Blood of Christ, only begotten Son of the Eternal Father, save us. Blood of Christ, incarnate Word of God, save us. Blood of Christ, of the New and Eternal Testament, save us. Blood of Christ, falling upon the earth in the agony, save us. Blood of Christ, shed profusely in the scourging, save us. Blood of Christ, flowing forth in the crowning with thorns, save us. Blood of Christ, poured out on the cross, save us. Blood of Christ, price of our salvation, save us. Blood of Christ, without which there is no forgiveness, save us. Blood of Christ, Eucharistic drink and refreshment of souls, save us. Blood of Christ, stream of mercy, save us. Blood of Christ, victor over demons, save us. 
Blood of Christ, courage of martyrs, save us. Blood of Christ, strength of confessors, save us. Blood of Christ, bringing forth virgins, save us. Blood of Christ, help of those in peril, save us. Blood of Christ, relief of the burden, save us. Blood of Christ, solace in sorrow, save us. Blood of Christ, hope of the penitent, save us. Blood of Christ, consolation of the dying, save us. Blood of Christ, peace and tenderness of hearts, save us. Blood of Christ, pledge of eternal life, save us. Blood of Christ, freeing souls from purgatory, save us. Blood of Christ, most worthy of all glory and honor, save us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, spare us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You have redeemed us, O Lord, in your blood, and made us for our God a kingdom. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you have appointed your only begotten Son, the Redeemer of the world, and will to be appeased by his blood. Grant, we beg of you, that we may worthily adore the price of our salvation, and through its power be safeguarded from the evils of this present life, so that we may rejoice in its fruits forever in heaven. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now that is not only an approved prayer by the church, that is a prayer of our redemption. The Sacred Heart, or I should say the Litany of the Most Precious Blood, which again ties to the Sacred Heart and the Divine Mercy. It's just all beautiful. So please keep that as close as you can. Recite that when you can. That is the way. And now I want to finish with a couple of quick announcements before I get to those, though. Uh, a lot of this is what I talk about is in my book, if Brother Mark can show. It's called Understanding Divine Mercy. You can get that right now for any donation. You can go to thedivinemercy.org slash UDM for Understanding Divine Mercy or call now 800-462-7426. Basically, that's 1 800 4 Marion, and you can get a copy. Next, we've been asking and inviting you all to become Marion helpers. You want to share in something special? Be a Marion helper with us. It takes less than 10 seconds, there's no cost. Visit micprayers.org and please join our team, our Marion Army, our, our, our beautiful gift of Mercy Marines. And so we want to do that. Now, I have two announcements that I'm excited to make. Okay. Basically, I have been, um, what's the right word? Um, finding it difficult to find a time for first Saturdays that works. And always God has a plan when something doesn't pan out the way you want it. Starting in August, the next first Saturday, we are going to do a new little format. I am going to begin on 11 o'clock, our same talk slot, but every first Saturday, I'm going to walk you through every Marian apparition approved, starting from the very first one. So some days we might only cover one if it's a big one. Other days I might be able to cover two or three. But I'm going to walk you through on the first Saturday of every month. That's going to be my Saturday talk. I'm going to walk you through every Marian apparition in order teaching you the meaning, what happened, and what our lesson is. And so that'll be at 11 o'clock every first Saturday. And then at 11.45, join us, because then we will do the devotion. We'll walk you through the chain of the requests of Mary, the, the act of contrition, the spiritual communion, the rosary, and the meditation. And I'll lead you in a meditation. So from 11.45 to 12.45 Eastern time, I will walk you through it. So that'll be our new first Saturday schedule. So you want to learn about Marian apparitions? Come here every first Saturday at 11 o'clock. We're going to walk you through them. Now, the big announcement that I have that came to me in prayer was I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I had this epiphany because 
I keep waiting for God to show me which direction to take everybody in. Which every direction, you guys have become Marian helpers, you've been tuning in. We first have to educate you on your faith because you can't love what you don't know. So God has me leading you in learning about your faith. But then at a point, he taught the apostles for three years, then he sent them out. And so I've been teaching you for a year, and now I feel from God it's starting to now result in sending you out. Father, I can't, I'm bedridden, that's okay. Because we got a plan. I wanna ask every one of you to join me. Now there's, you don't have to physically do anything. You don't have to sign up or, 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 or register anywhere, you don't have to. This is just in your heart. I wanna ask each and every one of you to join me every day to do one act of mercy. Now you might say, Father, I'm bedridden, I live alone, I don't have anybody to do act of mercy. Remember Jesus told St. Faustina in diary number 742, there's three ways to do mercy. I'm giving you three ways to exercise mercy, word, deed, and prayer. So if you go through your whole day and you're getting ready to go to bed and you say, oh my gosh, I didn't do a deed of mercy, it's okay. Say a Hail Mary for the world. Say in our Father for the sins, reparation for the sins against, or a Hail Mary for the reparation of the sins against the Immaculate Heart. That's an act of mercy. Say a prayer for your spouse. Say a prayer for your children. Say a glory be if you've only got 10 seconds because you're falling asleep. Join me in doing one act of mercy every day. It could be word, deed, or prayer. Words, say something nice to a coworker or a family member or a friend that you're struggling with. Do a nice deed. Maybe get something for somebody or leave a nice little note on their desk thinking of you, keeping you in prayer. Word, deed, or prayer. Again, if you're getting to bed at night and you realize that there's something that I, I, I haven't done yet, Father, say a prayer. Even a glory be it takes 10 seconds. You can join us in a daily act of mercy. And if we get enough people doing this, we have a, almost 200,000 subscribers now. Do you realize the difference we can make in the world? You don't have to sign up. You don't have to pay any dues. You don't have to buy anything. You just join me and I would love to hear from you. You don't have to share anything, but if you wanna put on the, in the comments what you're doing, help other people. You could put, Father, I'm doing this today. Wow, I didn't think about that. And then I want to invite you on every Friday to do an act of penance. Some act. Now, maybe you can fast. Please, I'm not telling you to fast because maybe your doctor, your health reasons. My mom can't fast because of her diabetes. But whatever you can do, you can give up a TV show, maybe. You could skip that second helping, a dessert. Whatever a little act of penance every Friday. Maybe it's eating no meat. That's what we're supposed to do, but the church teaches you can supplement it with something else. This is amazing. So if you join us, if we get enough people doing this, tell us on the live stream, I'm in, and, and, and feel free to share with us what you're doing. You'll give me ideas. But I'm going to do one every day as trying to be a good shepherd. And so if we come together in this and each and every one of us do one act of mercy a day, we've now multiplied it. We've multiplied it. This is an incredible opportunity for us to be God's children. And I felt strongly in prayer, God, that's it. That's what you're asking me to do. To ask you guys to join us. I hope to see it. I'm in. Join us. And if you want to share what you're doing, please do. If you don't, that's fine. Father, does it count if I don't sign up or I don't give what I'm doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just join us in, 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 in spirit. Do one act of mercy, any word, deed, or prayer. It's just the little things added up. Pretty soon it becomes a way of life. And so I want to show this here on, um, oh, so, sorry, did Brother Mark, did you show the first Saturday slide? Okay, so the first Saturday slide, let me show it up on the screen. That's 11 o'clock for the talk, 11.45. Let's go now to the last slide. Let's change the world. Let's show the last slide. This is any act of mercy each day and an act of penance each Friday. And if you want, Father, I want to know what some of these acts of mercies are. You can get something free. I will not charge you even shipping. I'm going to send it to you for free. No shipping, no charge. 
visit marion.org slash, don't forget to slash, live mercy, one word, L-I-V-E-M-E-R-C-Y, and I will send you a free pamphlet that will lay out for you the cardinal and the spiritual works of mercy that you could do, ideas, things that you can do for other people, word, deed, and prayer, or spiritual acts of mercy. These are great ways. And now we are living mercy. Now we are being disciples. Now we're coming together as a, as a mercy army, a mercy marine. And this is what we want to do. So I'll spare you guys from having to watch the video at the end as we normally play. I'm just going to have Mark end our, end, our, end our program today. But God bless you. I'm so fired up. And I'm sorry that I shout half the time because I know that annoys some of you. I just can't help it. <laughs> because this is everything. This is everything in our faith. So God bless you and join us in this mission. It takes very little to do, but so great in its impact. God bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.